Okay, so um, so uh, good evening, namaskar, and assalamualaikum to all of the participants to this uh, regional spice root webinar. I welcome you all on this World Family Doctors Day. Uh, I am Dr. Veena Kumari, National Secretary of the Spice Root Movement, and I will be the moderator of this event. So you will be hearing me today for um, this one hour. So uh, before um, we begin this um, session, just a brief uh, introduction to World Family Doctors Day. So uh, basically World Family Doctors Day, uh, initially this day, was started back in 2010 by the uh, World Organization of Family Doctors, Bonka. Since then, it has been uh, celebrated globally every year uh, to pay tribute to the uh, family doctors, so to uh, give uh, tribute to their contributions and recognize family physicians and to increase their morale and highlight their role in the healthcare system. So uh, this day, uh, we also thought the um, same uh, theme and uh, the theme for this year's World Family Doctors Day is uh, Family Doctors Always There to Care. So uh, today, so all those who have joined right now, so I welcome you all on behalf of the Spice Food uh, team on World Family Doctors Day. So uh, now I would like to start the session. So before starting, uh, I think if Dr. Sorry, Kaziz has joined. Wait, let me check. Okay. So um, before starting the session. Sankar is here. Okay. So before starting the session, I would like to ask Dr. Sankha who is currently the lead of the Young Doctors Movement and who has uh, served uh, as the regional chair of the Spice Root Movement also. So I would like to ask Dr. Sankar to say a few words, uh, share his thoughts on this uh, World Family Doctors Day. Dr. Sankar, can you unmute your mic and say a few words? Right, thank you, thank you very much, Veena. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to wish you all a very happy World Family Doctor Day 2022. Uh, and as uh, Veena correctly mentioned, this year's theme is family doctors always they are to care. And uh, to uh, not something very interesting, uh, this theme uh, is also one that's suggested by uh, young family doctors. Uh, where the executive committee was given the task to uh, collect teams for the, uh, this year's Family Doctor Day. Uh, one of our young doctors, Moment Donnelly, suggested this theme, Family Doctors Always They Are To Care. So this is uh, mainly, uh, we are talking about three pillars, always that's the continuity of care. They are the availability of family doctors in different places, different scenarios, and to care, the care, the accessible, sustainable, uh, and uh, uh, all uh, the, the uh, cost-effective care that it is provided by the family doctors. So based on these three pillars only this year, the World Family Doctors Day is uh, celebrated. So I'm really happy that uh, the Spice Root Movement is uh, celebrating uh, as usual in style. Uh, so, uh, because I know that uh, out of a lot of other Young Doctors Movement, uh, uh, the Spice Hood is the first uh, Young Doctors Movement to uh, go for a webinar on this special day, on the same day. So, congratulations, all of you, Zainab and Zainab, all the team, all the country. Uh, and I'm sure that this webinar would be a very useful one uh, in order to mark this very important event. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for inviting me uh, to uh, talk to you and uh, I wish you all success and a, family, a good, uh, very uh, successful year as well. Uh, thank you very much. Veena, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sankha, for sharing your words of wisdom and inspiring all the um, young doctors of the region. 
so now i would officially start uh, this webinar so today the um, our first speaker is dr rabia said so i think that most of you will be knowing dr rabia said also dr rabia said is from pakistan she is the fellow of college of surgeons and uh, college of physicians and surgeons of pakistan she is the consultant family physician and also she served as the national chair of uh, spice root movement of pakistan also so currently she is the head of the department of family medicine at liaquat national hospital karachi and she is also leading the outreach centers of the liaquat national hospital today she will be delivering talk on the family medicine the backbone of healthcare over to you dr rabia said dr rabia uh thank you veena um i would like to first of all uh thank all of your team the team of spice root movement for celebrating this world family doctor day and organizing such a wonderful uh webinar uh in including all the uh leads from south asia to share their thoughts and to uh work together Uh, and develop a way forward for promoting and developing the field of family medicine in our region not only in our region but in fact globally because we have participants from all over the world who are uh, attending this webinar so um, uh, affiliation with spice root is um, not new so it's something it's uh, Uh, something close to my heart so because uh, in the 2016 we started this uh, um, uh, movement with full zeal and enthusiasm in pakistan and um, uh, i'm so glad to see the progress uh, that has been made under the leadership of zena veena nishad and other members of uh, spice root movement from pakistan also i would like to acknowledge the contribution of our other colleagues from uh, india sri lanka who are always there nepal bhutan who are always there to uh, support the team of young family doctors and always um, you know uh, encouraging to uh, organize such efforts towards promotion of family medicine so let's start with the, today's talk so my topic when i was uh, asked to deliver a talk uh, on uh, um, uh, family medicine um, uh, backbone family medicine as a backbone of healthcare system so um, uh, it uh, actually uh, raised few questions so uh, so i think we all on this uh, day when when the whole world is celebrating and acknowledging the uh, role of family physicians all around the world it's high time that we all should recall and we all should review the role and scope of family medicine and the impact it has in our healthcare system so there are always changes uh, challenges that we faced worldwide but there are some unique challenges that are pertaining to developing worlds and especially in south asian countries so i think it is very important to address those challenges as well so my talk is about uh, addressing those challenges um and also to uh, develop a way forward on how we can strengthen this backbone of our primary care which is family medicine with family doctors on the forefront so let's discuss so why we say that it is why we you know call family medicine as a backbone of healthcare system uh, so uh, it's something that uh, everything uh, relies upon so is starting from the diagnosis not only from diagnosis so we start from prevention i think not from prevention also but we start from health promotion so we work as the primordial level of prevention and then starting from the um uh, preventive role we go towards the curative aspect of medicine and our role does not end here we also manage the rehabilitative role of healthcare system where we are involved in the rehabilitation of uh, patient care not only patient our scope is not limited to patients our scope is limited to their families not only to families but to communities but to the society as a whole 
So the range is very vast. So it's actually the pivot on which every other thing relies upon. So uh, that is why there's no doubt about it that the whole scope of family medicine is actually inevitable for any healthcare system. So the system of healthcare in any country should stand and must stand on family medicine as a primary care speciality. So as you know, every speciality has its own attribute. So this is the um, uh, uh, diagram that again is very close to my heart. So it actually summarizes the um, dynamic role of a family physician. So starting from the clinical competence and the cost effectiveness in managing the patients, providing the comprehensive health care, focusing more on the common problems to address the base of pyramids, peer coordination, including the importance of community health care, including the importance of counseling, patient advocacy, which ensures the continuity of care, the whole circle of family medicine or the whole circle of family physicians components actually play a very, very vital role in, in, in improving the healthcare indicators of any community. So when we talk about that family medicine is a backbone, so we talk about preventive care. So family physicians are, are not only in action when the disease occurs, we don't follow only the illness-based approach, but we follow the wellness-based approach. So we focus on risk factor assessment and we work before the disease starts, before the risk factors emerge actually. And then we work jointly with the patient to address those risk factors and work towards modification of those risk factors. We talk about screening. So actually, so even if the patient has risk factors, or even if the family has risk factors and we are working on the risk factor modification, we don't stop here. We move one step ahead. And when the disease occurs and it is not producing any symptoms, we focus on screening. We focus on immunization. We focus on secondary prevention. If disease occurs, then we provide the best possible care to minimize the complications. And then even for those patients in which the complications occur, in which the disability occurs, family physicians are again leading the show. And they are the main leads in providing the rehabilitative care of patients. So just imagine the vast scope of family physicians in providing preventive care. Other roles of family physicians when we talk about primary care network. So it's important to understand that. So it is basically targeted on five main factors. So let, let me share the recent example of COVID pandemic who utilizes their primary care services. They were far better in managing the COVID pandemic. So triage and treatment comes at the primary allocation, primary uh, care level. Disease surveillance can easily be done at a primary care level. Affordable care can be easily managed. Hospitalization risk can be easily minimized if a proper primary care team or a primary health care network is available in the system. So we say that family physicians are the gateway to health care. So whenever uh, there is any, any illness or when we talk about even wellness, so the first point of contact that all the patients should have and they must have should, should be the family physicians. So initial triage and screening can easily be done and can easily be uh, well managed at primary care level. It will not only result in a uh, reduced cost but to, to the patient, but also to improve the health outcomes as, as well. Urgent care services can easily be provided at primary care level. When we talk about family physicians, so they are the care coordinators and they interlink different levels of healthcare services to provide better care to patient. We all know that when, when uh, in, a, in a country or in places where the healthcare system is fragmented, if a patient has 
um, uh, chest pain. So they will go to the cardiologist first. Cardiologist will say, no, it's not my problem. They will go to a gastroenterologist then. They will say, no, it's not my problem. They will go to an orthopedic. They will say, yeah, probably it's my, uh, it's because of any um, uh, issue related to that. So what happens? This, this problem can easily be managed if the patient comes to a family physician right from the beginning and the family physicians after evaluating them and after managing them probably would be the better person to coordinate the referral of services between different level of care. So this kind of coordination is important at government level as well, for healthcare stakeholders as well, because it is going to ultimately minimize the burden of secondary and tertiary level of care, who ultimately will get to see only those patients that are actually gen that actually and genuinely genuinely deserve their care. Unnecessary referrals and burden in hospitals can be minimized, and the hospital resources can be utilized more efficiently if majority of the problems can be dealt at primary care level. So bringing care at home through domiciliary care, another very uh, emerging uh, field of family medicine that has been recently, that has been recently more active during COVID pandemic where most of the people would try to consult uh, healthcare uh, from their home. So medicine, televideo, um, home healthcare service. So these are the avenues which family physicians can explore more to improve the quality of care to their patients, for their patients. So again, we never leave a patient without providing any education. So I think so all of you, all of the family physicians must agree, that even if, if the patient comes to us, so I think it's in our blood that unless we provide a piece of advice, a small piece of education to our patients, so we feel that the consultation is incomplete. So we believe on the holistic care approach. So we call it, so when I uh, uh, teach my residents, so when they are with us and they are seeing a patient or, uh, and presenting a patient uh, problem, so I would say, please utilize family medicine approach. So what is family medicine approach? It's, it is actually the whole person approach. It's not dealing with a problem, but dealing with a person. So it is such a unique and such a beautiful feature, um, which actually builds the foundation of our speciality. So I think this is something we should, proud, we should feel proud upon. So we never leave any opportunity. So just like when we are, when we plan to, when anyone plans to travel, uh, uh, so they they arrange their um, vaccinations, they stay up to date on their medications. So they plan something, they pack their bags. So likewise, we family physician never leave an opportunity to provide to work upon the health improvement or of, of our patients, even if they are coming for. Uh, so example, for example, if there is a fifty year old patient coming for hypertensive uh, follow-up in our clinic. So we never leave this opportunity to tell that uh, lady that, see, you need to get your screening mammogram. See, you need to get this, vac this vaccinations updated. See, you need to get your um, uh, blood sugars screened for diabetes. So, so that's how uh, our um, opportunistic care or our preventive care actually produce a huge difference in the quality of life of our patients and their families, obviously. So um, a family physician or a family doctor wears a lot of caps. So uh, he's a he or she is a care provider, but at the same time, they are clinical trainers, they're supervisors, they're training students, they're training teams, they are leading teams. So they are working with a team of multidisciplinary healthcare professionals, or maybe sometimes uh, non-healthcare professionals to, um, uh, to, to develop the clinical governance of the setup, to work with the community leaders, to improve the healthcare system, or to improve the healthcare outcomes of the community. So they are actually leaders who are working towards capacity building. They are mentoring the healthcare staff during the course of clinical service. So, so, so the backbone is so strong that um, uh, it, ha it plays multiple roles at the same time. 
so now so now we all are definitely uh, it's always good to uh, revive the good qualities or the um, uh, special and unique features of our speciality and especially on this world family doctor day we should feel um, uh, pride in uh, to be a part of this to be a part of this team to be a family doctor so when we talk about the challenges so despite of the huge benefits and advantages family medicine has or the position of family medicine uh, uh, in the primary care system there are certain challenges so why it is not accepted the way it should be being such an important part of the healthcare system why it has not been given the place it deserves so there are certain challenges uh, today we are going to talk about the challenges that we face in developing countries particularly in south asian re region so that we all can relate to it so first of all there is a gap in recognizing family medicine as a specialized field so whoever graduates uh, can practice as a family physician can get the license to work as a general practitioner so people can equate general practitioners with the trained family physicians so ultimately the quality of care that the patient gets is not at the same level is not at the same standard that a trained family physician can provide this is a major barrier in developing a sound concept of family medicine for a layman for common people so lack of training of opportunities so even if the um, if if there are doctors who would like to get training in family medicine so we have limited training opportunities we have very limited trained family physicians in um, in different parts of the world it, especially when we talk about developing countries because of its recent acceptance as a specialized field so definitely uh, there is also lack of consensus on degrees and eligibility to practice as i said earlier sometimes uh, uh, sometimes the practices even without training so uh, allocation of healthcare budget on primary care training is actually very important not only on training but actually on the health service delivery at primary care level this is actually a very important part which is unfortunately lacking in many of the developing countries so it's actually the base of pyramid of healthcare so majority of the problems as you know comes to family physicians so obviously uh, 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 as per the demand that it has on the fam or it, uh, as it has uh, according to the demand uh, that we have on the healthcare system it is very important that the resources are also allocated accordingly and unfortunately um, this is not true in our case of family medicine so yes we need to work jointly towards recognition of field as a speciality in our own countries then it is important that government should be very serious in um, uh, allocating budget for development of primary care capacity building for family physicians and providing them with the adequate training and probably on job professional development opportunities is very important and it is very important for the survival of healthcare system when we talk about who universal health coverage and achievement of the goals of uh, 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 universal health coverage it is very important that we should invest in scaling up primary healthcare services in low and middle income countries as you can see the figure it would potentially save 60 million lives increase life average life expectancy and definitely contribute significantly to social economic development so let's summarize the talk uh, the care provided must be comprehensive it should address all health problems in all patients at all stages of life and continues over time just continuity of care care must be accessible to each and every member in the local community so we being the initial part of the healthcare system or as the entry point of healthcare system we should be always be available family physicians should always be available to assess patient rep to other healthcare providers or services training must be based predominantly in primary care setting so uh, the family physicians 
um, should be trained in a primary care setting as well, uh, despite of the fact that most of the training which are available in family medicine are hospital based. So it is important to get hospital training as well, but a major part of training should also focus on primary care setting where their actual domain and scope of practice should lie. Health policy support should always be available. Otherwise, um, uh, it is not possible to achieve the universal health coverage code. Equitable payment of primary health care providers should be there. Um, healthy uh, co uh, compensation should be provided as compared with their colleagues which are working in hospitals and other areas of special specialization. Thank you so much. So I would um, be happy to answer any question. Thank you, Dr. Rabia, for a wonderful talk. So uh, if anyone has question uh, here, she can ask now. Uh, and before moving on to the next talk, I would take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Raman Kumar from India. I think he is here with us. So Dr. Raman, Raman Kumar is an inspirational leader for whole of this region. And uh, he also served as the president of Wonka South Asia. So Dr. Raman, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Veena. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Raman, uh, Namaskar. Can you please say a few words and share your experience on this day? Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Janab and all Spice Root leaders. Uh, I'm really happy to be here especially on this day of uh, World Family Doctors' Day. So we just heard Dr. Ravia speaking so nicely, comprehensively about the concept. So I need not uh, repeat that. And we all stand for this concept, not just because uh, you know this is what we do, but because this is also largely required for the, our communities, families, and the population that we serve. And I'm very happy to see you all as upcoming uh, leaders. You all already are uh, leaders of your own uh, identity. So uh, my best wishes to all of you and may you all progress and uh, gain uh, all in your career and personal lives. You all are very young and long uh, uh, way to go ahead in life. So I, I wish best and all success for all of you. So uh, I won't take time. I understand that there is a, a, you know, a lineup of all other speakers and uh, very good to see you know, around 40 participants from our region. In spite of all the political problems, we connect, we stay together. And that is a very, very healthy and good uh, academic environment. So congratulations to all of you and my best wishes to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raman, for saying uh, nice words for all of the young doctors of this region. So uh, now I am moving to the next talk as there are no questions uh, till yet. So we can uh, answer the questions if there are any at the end also. So now the next speaker of today's webinar is Dr. Jyotika Gupta. She is from India and she is DNP in Family Medicine and MRCGP International. She is a practicing family physician in uh, Bangalore, India and an executive member of the AFPI Karnataka chapter. She is also serving as a national secretary of the Spice Roof Movement of India. And she has a special interest in the management of chronic diseases, preventive medicine, and infectious uh, diseases. So today, uh, she would be giving us talk on the family medicine and universal health coverage. So over to you, Dr. Jyotika. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, happy Fa World Family Doctors Day to everybody here. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening to one and all. All my colleagues from South Asia who have joined us. Uh, respect to Dr. Raman and all senior colleagues who have joined me here. So uh, on the occasion of World Family Doctors Day, let's uh, see what is universal health coverage. So uh, actually, this is quite a new topic that I have really never spoken about. Usually, I speak on clinical topics. So this was a good learning as well. 
uh, and what better occasion than the World Family Doctors Day. So universal health coverage. We will uh, be touching about these points. What is universal health coverage? How did it all start? Why is it essential? And what is our role in achieving universal health coverage? So I thought uh, I'll bring in a little bit of uh, clinical part in this. Let's uh, see a few scenarios where, uh, which we come across on a regular basis in our practice. Um, so the patient says, doctor, I've missed my diabetic and heart medicines because I have to buy my stock after I get my pension. I'm sure all of us have seen this in our practice. Another example, the parent says, I will get my child's appendix surgery next month as I cannot afford it now. Uh, we have seen, heard, and probably experienced a pregnant lady could not reach the hospital on time and hence lost her life by delivering en route. A victim of snake bite in a rural area could not get access to anti-snake venom and hence lost his life. So why am I bringing out these examples is this is what is lack of universal health coverage. So what is universal health coverage? It means all people have access to health services that they need when, where they need it and when they need it without any financial hardship. So the core word here is financial hardship. And I think in South Asia, uh, we see it day in and day out, whether we are in a rural setup or an urban setup or a semi-urban setup, it is a common uh, challenge for us. Universal health coverage includes the full range of essential health services, whether it's from health promotion or prevention, treatment, rehabilitation and palliative care. All these points have been uh, highlighted by Dr. Rabia as well, that as a family physician, this is what we can provide to all our patients. Statistically speaking, about 100 million people all over the world are pushed into extreme poverty each year because of out-of-pocket spending on health. And this is where we are failing on providing this health coverage to the population of the world. So uh, it's easy to speak uh, philosophically, but in reality, what is it that we really need if we have to achieve universal health coverage? So there are three main pillars that are required. One is we need skilled healthcare workers. We need individuals and communities who are able to uh, achieve and uh, access quality healthcare services. And finally, our policymakers who are committed to investing in universal health coverage. Also, as Dr. Rabia had said that uh, we need more investment in terms of GDP from, the country, from any countries or nation side to invest into healthcare and skilled healthcare workers who can provide quality care, people-centric care, and it should also be affordable. So till these three verticals do not work hand in hand, realistically achieving universal health coverage is going to be a challenge for all of us. But when we do it at our individual level, when we fulfill the needs for the society in the form of providing uh, care in the community, we will, we will be doing our part. The individuals and communities also should have access to high quality healthcare services, whether it's in their community, whether it's in their town, in their district, or in their country. And uh, that's where our role comes in. It should be based on strong people-centered primary healthcare. Because primary healthcare, as we all know, we are all in that, we are rooted in the communities. And we not, not only focus on treating the illness, but on health awareness, prevention of diseases, mainly primordial uh, prevention of diseases. And it, uh, after a person has been diagnosed of some illness, we also help in providing uh, rehabilitation services, um, whether it's palliative care. Basically, we, uh, we intend to improve the quality of life through our health care. And that is what is the key uh, role of universal health coverage. A few facts, uh, over 930 million people all over the world spend at least 10% of their household income on healthcare. 100 million people are driven into poverty each year 
because of out of pocket health spending about 75% of the national health policy strategies and plans are now aimed at moving towards universal health coverage but we really have a long way to go and ironically after all of this half of the world's population does not have access to the health care that they need and the health care that they deserve so uh, where did all this start from so way back in 2012 so we're talking about 10 years back on 12th of december a resolution on global health and foreign policy was recommended to include universal health coverage in the discussions when uh, the un met for formulating policies along with the world health organization it was recommended to include it but till 2015 there was no fixed agenda and no fixed protocols that were actually released although the nations which participated they recognized the importance of this uh, coverage which should be included in every nation's uh, policies in their national programs but they also realized that all this can be achieved through primary health care and social protection mechanisms especially if we are targeting the poor segments of the population because uh, financial constraint is the most common reason for a uh, lack of achieving this universal health coverage and uh, to mark this uh, 12th of december every year is celebrated as international universal health coverage day it it was said to increase global awareness international solidarity international cooperation and action towards the achievement of universal health coverage by promoting national regional and global collaborative frameworks and forums so if you can see this uh, little uh, logo it uh, actually symbolizes the umbrella of healthcare that can be provided by family physicians and by primary care physicians to promote and to uh, achieve universal health coverage everything under one umbrella so in 2012 when uh, things were recommended up till september 2015 uh, nothing really moved forward but in 2015 the resolution on transforming our world that is the 2030 agenda was actually released and like we all know the sustainable development goals uh, were announced and in that the third sustainable goal uh, actually uh, was uh, dedicated for healthcare and this also included financial risk protection access to the quality essential healthcare services and it should be easily available especially the preventive uh, care like vaccines uh last year in 2021 uh the logo or rather the um, uh the mission was leave no one's health behind invest in health systems for all so to promote physical mental social well being and to extend life expectancy not just in the number of years but in the quality of life that we all uh, look forward to we must achieve universal health coverage and access to quality health care hence we must leave no one behind uh, money or the social or the economic background or cultural reasons should not be a reason for anyone to be to have in uh, no access to health care so the international universal health coverage day it aims to raise an awareness for the need for strong and resilient health systems uh, and this can be done with multi stakeholder partners so whether it's the primary care physician whether it's the patient uh, people in the community uh, ngos the policy makers the governments of various countries and uh, with the support of un and who when all these come together is when we can achieve this and this means making more smarter investments in the foundations of health system as well and that's where we need to emphasize on primary health care essential services for the and marginalized populations also and i think covid pandemic has shown us more than enough uh, about the need for primary care because we all were we stepped forward and stood in the front line when the pandemic hit us unexpectedly and we donned many roles whether we provided home care services whether we took on um, roles of interns uh, internists in the icus uh, whether we provided rehab care we also educated and 
trained every patient. We trained our nursing staff, our paramedical staff. We donned different hats and we proved that a family physician is what is who can take this forward. Uh, so, uh, in continuation with that, there is the global movement called the UHC 2030, which is aimed at building stronger health systems in a way to achieve this universal health coverage. So, it is like a global movement uh, wherein um, different stakeholders, they gather, they uh, discuss about different policies and uh, contribute to advocacy tools, guidance, knowledge and learning as to how uh, things can be changed and challenges can be overcome to achieve universal health coverage. And uh, it needs the support of more and more countries uh, on a larger level and uh, at the community level, everybody needs to be a part of this so that nobody is left behind. Uh, like I said, whether it's the government, international organizations, global health initiatives, the philanthropic foundations, the civil society, and the private sector, everybody needs to work in tandem. Only then this goal can be achieved. And through this global platform, that is the UHC 2030, the aim is to achieve uh, these goals by the year 2030. And uh, every year, this is also celebrated, like I said, in uh, December. Uh, so, uh, to summarize on the UHC 20, uh, 2030, the idea is to not leave anyone behind, to be transparent and accountable for any result or any policy that is made, use evidence-based national health strategies and leadership, and to make health systems everybody's business, whether it is the citizens, the communities, the civil society, the private sector, the policyholders, at every level. And till there is international cooperation on this, uh, I think nothing is going to stop us. So, uh, very interestingly, this is PHC for UHC. So, primary health care for universal health coverage. So, uh, this symbol is the uh, symbol for the third uh, sustainable development goal, which was, which was announced by uh, the United Nations. And this goal uh, is called for good health and well-being. The, there are totally 17 goals, the SDGs, and they focus on various things like safe water, uh, uh, education, equitable uh, responsibilities, and climate change, and education, eradicating poverty. So in that, in line with this integrated vision of the SDGs, the targets under this third goal, it relates directly to health and well-being and uh, while being influenced by and influencing the other development goals. So uh, what they're trying to say is everything goes hand in hand. If we want to achieve one of those development goals, everything has to work in tandem and everything has to be integrated. And this can be done in a no better way than by uh, improving and achieving uh, through primary health care. So they had another uh, slogan, all people everywhere deserve, deserve the right care right in their community. So this is what primary health care actually wants to achieve. And in a way, we all are doing it at our own personal level or at the community level. That every patient who comes to us, irrespective of the age and irrespective of the uh, 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 complaint or whatever uh, issue they have, everybody uh, deserves a care from us and right there in the community. They shouldn't be denied um, any type of services for any reason. So even primary health care uh, was not clearly defined uh, in the initial time, but in the declaration of Alma-Ata in 1978, which was uh, where the uh, declaration was made. And 40 years later, the global leaders actually ratified on this. And at the conference in Kazakhstan in October 2018, this was formally announced and uh, protocols were set in place to work towards achieving primary health care. So uh, this is a very interesting diagram, um, which shows us the real integration between primary health care, between the sustainable goals set by the UN, and how these 
can work together to achieve universal health coverage. And once universal health coverage is achieved, which actually falls under the third sustainable goal, can primary health care also be strengthened? So these are the 17 goals uh, which have been defined by the UN. And that the third one, like I said, which is for the good health and well-being. Primary care with its three strong pillars, uh, and which we all have been working towards, when that is strengthened, it will help in access, quality, and financial protection of every individual. And we will be closer in achieving universal health coverage. The advantage of primary care or family medicine is that we can, uh, we can solve any type of medical issue, whether it's related to maternal and children health, whether it's sexual and reproductive health services, prevention, uh, prevention of chronic diseases, prevention of diabetes, uh, educating the people about diabetes and hypertension so that the other complications can be prevented, treatment of substances you abuse, preventing and treating on non-communicable diseases, uh, uh, treating all the communicable diseases, of course, like any viral infections, COVID being our closest example, malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, bacterial infections like typhoid. So it is a one-stop shop which also uh, helps in achieving uh, financial, uh, uh, I mean, it helps in eliminating financial constraints. So everybody of the family can see the family doctor and get access to healthcare. Like I was saying, it addresses the majority of a person's health needs throughout their lifetime. So we not only uh, have access to, I mean, we are not only good in uh, having a depth of uh, a particular subject, but also the breadth of a subject. This includes whether physical, mental, social well-being. And uh, family physicians have this knack and the special ability, I would say, that we work towards people-centered uh, treatment than disease-centered treatment. So we will treat the person as a whole. Probably we will also be taking into consideration their family, their economic background, their cultural restrictions. Everything will be thought about when a family physician does the consultation. And like even Dr. Rabia said, that before we end our consultation, we always make it a point to educate or empower our patient in whatever little way we are able to do. So this whole society approach is what is our USP and hence strengthening the family medicine network, the primary health care is going to go a long way in achieving universal health coverage as well. So the three main components which uh, we work on, one is meeting people's health needs throughout their lives, of course. So it, uh, uh, the, um, the slogan which has been uh, used this year, always, always there to care. So we are always present throughout their lives, addressing the broader determinants of health through multi-sectoral policy and action, and then empowering the individuals, the families, the communities, wherein we tell them to, we educate them to take charge of their own health. Uh, once we empower one person or we educate one person, the entire family can be taken care of. So what are the components of primary health care? Um, two main things, that is we provide personalized service and it's also population-based service. So under the personal services, we are always the first point of contact since we are available in the community. We are in the neighborhood. The person can reach out to us at, at the start of any illness. And once a patient has reached out to us, we always provide care in a comprehensive manner. We do not treat the disease alone. We treat the person. Always there to care. We, are, we provide continued services, continued support, whether it's uh, mental, uh, social, uh, mental and social well-being as well. Coordination, this is another very important aspect that we specialize in. We always coordinate uh, with the specialists, uh, with other specialists, with the patient, with the family and our own network. And our services are always, always person-centered person that we have always uh, tried to achieve. And in, in the, uh, when we are trying to achieve this uh, personalized care, we always uh, look at the population-based services as well. So we uh, always focus on health protection and health promotion. We think about disease prevention and not just about uh, treatment. 
So uh, ours is more of a proactive care than a reactive care. At the same time, we are also involved in surveillance and responses. So whether it is communicable diseases, uh, uh, disaster management, non-communicable diseases, everything goes under the scrutiny of a family physician. There is nothing that a family physician cannot do. And uh, like I said, even disaster and emergency preparedness is also our quality. So I wanted to summarize by saying that uh, primary healthcare is the best and the uh, uh, easiest form of achieving universal health coverage. Uh, Dr. Veena, I just wanted to share one small video, which uh, also will summarize my entire talk. Just give me a minute. Is this visible? Yes. yes. So I just want to end my talk with this and leave everybody with these thoughts. You might have heard people talking about universal health coverage, but what does it really mean? Think about it this way. What do you need to get, be, and stay healthy? Can you get help from a well-trained health worker? Can you get treatment that helps you get better and is safe? Can you get the medicines and other health products you need? Who will pay for it? Are there policies in place to ensure the services you need are available to you, your family and your community next time and every time? Does your government have accurate information about the whole system so they can make the right decisions to keep everything working the way it should? Good health needs people, services, products, finances, policies, and information, and needs all of them to work together even in times of crisis. Good health systems don't just treat sick people. They help to promote healthy living and prevent people from falling ill in the first place. The World Health Organization is working around the world so that all people and communities receive the quality services they need and are protected from health threats without suffering from financial hardship. That's what we call universal health coverage. Thank you, everyone. So thank you, Dr. Jyotika, for giving us a brief introduction on the universal health coverage. Now, without wasting time, I would like to ask our next, next speaker, who is Dr. Kinele Bhutti uh, from Bhutan. Dr. Kinele Bhutti is a practicing GP at the Paro General Hospital in Bhutan and aspired representative at the Spice Root Movement. She is also the national chair uh, of the Spice Root Movement Bhutan. Dr. Bhutti has done her MBBS from the Chittagong Medical College, Bangladesh, and MD in the general practice, uh, MD, MD in the general practice from the Kesar Chipalo University of Medical Sciences of Bhutan. Dr. Bhutti also presented her research work on the 10 years CVD risk assessment and patients attending to the National Referral Hospital of Bhutan at the Wonka Rural Conference in Abu Dhabi. So today, Dr. Bhutti, will be presenting a talk on the uh, family medicine past, present, and the future. So over to you, Dr. Bhutti. Thank you, Bella, for the kind introduction. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I, is my slide uh, visible? Hello? Uh, yes, can we can see the slides. Okay. So, uh, Thank you for giving this opportunity. Uh, I'm Mikili Bhutti from Bhutan. I, my topic to speak for tonight is uh, family medicine, the past, present, and the future. So it's a very short presentation. The outline of the presentation is basically to talk, talk about past, the present, the challenges we face in the present time, and the future. So in the past, there were no GPs at all in Bhutan. 
uh, all the general uh, services were provided by the MBBS graduates, which who were very fresh, but they lacked experience. So there was no adequate care in the rural uh, areas and all were rushing to uh, urban higher centers, overwhelming the health centers in the urban areas. And also many of the population of the rural and unreachable uh, people were not uh, getting access to the health. And in the past, the GPs were not recognized, so they were less interested candidates. So if we talk about uh, the present, uh, present, there's a Bhutan recognized uh, GP just recently about four years ago. So it first started in 2017 and I was the first uh, and the only candidate who took, took up the GP program. So there needs to be lots of advocacy to um, to inspire more doctors to take up GP. And they, to do that, there is terms of references uh, laid out very clearly for the future. And also uh, for all the responsibilities that GPs will, GPs will do when they hit the district hospitals. And the fellowship opportunities attack the, uh, and attack the uh, young doctors to take up the GP program. So when there's a clear career ladder, it makes the young, young MBBS graduates to take up this GP. So th there needs to be more policies to make the GPs more attractive. Because as we have already heard uh, two uh, speakers ahead of me who spoke about the universal health care and the wholesome uh, primary health care. So we are, the whole, uh, we are the ones who give the whole care to the patients and which we form the base of the pyramid in the man management of the patients. So in Bhutan, we have total of uh, roughly 342 doctors and 30 MBBS graduates working in district hospitals, uh, which are 30 bedded. And I, I work in one of the district hospitals in Bhutan. And then uh, in the rural areas, mostly the basic health units, it is uh, manned by the health assistants. There are about 500 uh, plus health assistants in Bhutan. And we have only four trained GPs, including myself. My seniors are being uh, trained in India and Nepal, and I'm, I'm the first one to be trained in Bhutan. And we have three undergoing GP trainings at present in Bhutan. So if we, uh, I tried to look at the data in the Southeast Asian region, but I could not find, but there is one data found in the, um, NHS, where we can see the number of GPs, uh, their uh, number of GPs being in England. So we can see that there are about almost uh, 20,000 plus GPs, which are partnered with other specialist, uh, specialized uh, doctors. And uh, there are a few number, number of other doctors which, are, which functions as locums to uh, GPs to provide the general service. So if we look at the work commitment of qualified or permanent GPs per week, this is also the data taken out from uh, NHS England. So we can see that a very less number of uh, GPs they have, their work, working hours is less than 15. Mostly the most of the GPs, their working hours is from 15 hours to 37 hours in a week. So including myself, my usual uh, normal working hours is usually uh, it's most of the time 36 hours, but on for my on call uh, on call week, it will be uh, almost 100 plus. So in the present, um, if we there is one study conducted in uh, Indonesia, GP was uh, very newly being uh, stipulated in the Medical Foundation Act as number 20. It was uh, um, stipulated only in 2013, and they changed the terminology from the primary health physician. Um, which is equivalent to a specialist. So when they made it uh, as an equivalent to other specialists, there were more doc doctors who took up the GP. So which helped these doctors to gain more insight and skills to, to provide uh, primary health uh, care to the populations. So if we look at uh, this diagram, so there are various forces which needs uh, to activate the general pool of doctor. So we can see that there's massive information promotion of general practice needed, and then support systems are needed in, in terms of scholarships and facilities and authorities and in, incentives in, in terms of uh, 
uh, uh, money. And then the, there's also support needed from the government uh, and higher education sector. So even with all these three forces available for a pool of doctors, most of the doctors are unfamiliar with the uh, GP practice and some are not sure whether to take this GP or not. And very few, they take up the GP uh, career. So how do we retain this uh, GP? Like uh, GP and family medicine are the same. So I'm using, because the general practice is a term used in my country. So I will be using this term more frequently. So how can we retain these uh, general uh, practitioners of the GP in the rural areas? This is, a, there was a study done in uh, rural uh, Nepal. So they found that there are various, uh, there were many, Many factors that that uh, that were uh, hampering or that were leading to the lead, leading to leading uh, to the um, immigration of doctors from uh, rural areas to urban areas. One was the first one was the financial incentives, uh, the, the financial needs. So when they were paid a little bit of incentives, they were. Uh, uh, willing to stay in uh, rural areas. Another one is clinical autonomy. They were uh, when they were given a clinical autonomy to be, to practice in rural areas and given some form of auto, uh, autonomy, they were staying there. And the community support the, because we are the ones uh, giving the public uh, primary health services. So community health uh, support was the must. And then also another one was uh, task for arrangements. Uh, and then the, even the uh, nursing workforce, when we have a strong nursing workforce to help a uh, general practitioner, so the more uh, general practitioners prefer the strong and uh, skilled nursing to work, uh, nurses to be uh, uh, helping them, and then perception of quality, and allied workforce and GP workforce stability. So these are the uh, few uh, uh, factors that can help retain the GPs in rural areas. Okay, so, uh, and, and some of the issues that caused the GPs to migrate from rural to urban were the management issues, even the workload, a lone GP like myself was, uh, 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 made to man a district hospital so some of the management issues the work workload and then even even the spouse satisfaction and child education because education is more um, uh, like more advanced and more uh, better in in urban areas so we tend to move from rural areas to urban area and even to access to basic uh, utensils uh, and shopping and other services so challenges we face as a GP is the search in uh, department uh, demand for appointments. So we don't have capacity to meet the demand demands due to lack of workforce and poor infrastructure. And then this uh, over the past few years because of the pandemic, the workload increased in size and complexity about 10% more. And so how can we fix these challenges? If, if a greater investment is done in the primary health management, then this can relieve lots of our problem since general practice can provide complex person-centered care and, and we can prevent most of the worsening conditions. So in the future, in the future for GP in Bhutan, we are uh, to extend to all the stakes to be manned by GPs and then to community to the basic health unit, enhance all primary health care services and improve NCDs and all other health promotional services. And we can also follow up on all the tertiary health cares and strengthen overall health care services like uh, all uh, primary health cares, universal health cares and everything. But then the issue is, where is the pool of doctor? So where is the future now? So that still lies a question. So that's it. Good night. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Kenley Bhutti, for such a nice talk. So as uh, I can't see any... Um, questions till now so if anyone has any question from the audience from any of our uh, speakers just raise your hand and ask directly so, 
I don't think so. There are any questions. Okay. So uh, there are no questions from any of the speakers. That's very good. So uh, thank you all speakers for uh, taking out time and giving us your valuable um, uh, feedback and uh, uh, talk on important topics on uh, family uh, medicine and uh, general practice. So I would like to uh, uh, say uh, all of you a uh, very happy World Family Doctors Day. And now I would uh, like to invite Dr. Zainab Muhammad who is the uh, national chair of the Spice Food Movement of Pakistan and also the regional chair of the Spice Food uh, uh, Wonka South Asia Young Doctors Movement. So I would like to uh, ask Dr. Zainab to say a few words and concluding uh, remarks for this today's webinar. Over to you, Dr. Zainab. Uh, thank you, Veena. Um, thank you. Um, so this is Happy World Family Doctors Day to all the uh, young doctors who have uh, joined us today. I think Dr. Feroz uh, Khan has raised his hand, so I would like to give yeah. him an opportunity to speak. Yes. So let me unmute. Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. This is Dr. Okay. Feroz from. No. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm Dr. Feroz, working oh. as a physician here in uh, Dubai, actually. Uh, uh, I've been practicing here for the past uh, seven years as a specialist family medicine. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I just have a suggestion actually, like, uh, see, I have been going through uh, this, actually, I have mailed uh, many of the uh, various departments in family medicine in the USA, UK, and different areas, uh, where actually we could still increase the scope of family medicine practice, like post-family medicine specializations, actually, like, uh, I mean, like, see, there have been actually huge increase in requirement of doctors in intensive care, in emergency, in, in post-COVID actually means even uh, during the COVID actually I have been working in the ICU because I have also done my fellowship in critical care. Uh, I mean if there isn't any official uh, program actually like post if there is a kind of uh, post uh, family medicine specializations actually like which you will be officially recognized by the governments of particular any of the countries it could be India or uh, any other countries where we are actually so uh, where the scope of family medicine can be extended not just limited to the family medicine practice actually we could also have uh, such kind of uh, officially listed programs so that we would not limit ourselves only to the family medicine practice I see uh, I do have a, uh, my own uh, spirometry clinic and uh, sleep medicine as well but uh, we need an officially recognized program so where we could also uh, have a, a recognized degree I mean, this is my humble suggestion, actually, where we all can work together so that we could see more people uh, get more involved into the family medicine, because uh, I feel it's a broad specialty degree. Uh, uh, I mean, as compared, not that because I have done family medicine, but if you see uh, an internal medicine or an anesthesia or a pulmonology doing a critical care program uh, compared to a family medicine, actually, who has done a critical care program, the scope of knowledge and the scope of practice will be a huge impact, actually. I mean, this is my humble uh, suggestion that's it uh thank you dr feroz i think that's a wonderful suggestion i had read uh this suggestion of yours in the chat box also um uh, i yes i think uh, uh fam what family physicians can do uh, i think most of the even people who specialize they also cannot do because we have been trained to be um connected with the people and uh, empower people when it comes to their management plan. So what we can do is, um, I think uh, whatever we can do uh, at our level is almost and always, I believe, and maybe I'm biased because uh, I'm a family physician myself, but I strongly feel that this speciality, if, it's, if, the, if a GP is well-trained, they can do things in a much better way than any other uh, specialized person would do. Uh, any other cardiologist maybe would do uh, would go to an ICU uh, fellowship um, and a family physician would go. So I think I believe that a family physician would do a much better job at it. I let that be counseling the family, counseling the patient uh, and everything. Uh, if anybody wants to add on to the uh, answer, so we will be most uh, welcome. Uh, we will welcome anybody who wants to comment on the uh, uh, question and the suggestion, but I strongly feel that this is a wonderful suggestion and a more specialization uh, would not um, limit uh, family medicine in 
I feel uh, limit the family physician. It will empower family physician to do more uh, for the patient. So thank you for the wonderful suggestion. I think if uh, we all work together, so this could also be achieved um, in uh, hopefully near future. Um, and uh, so as I can see, I can't see many questions. Neither I can see any raised hands. So and also we have um, crossed a little bit of we are off a little beyond a little time that we had selected for our for the webinar that we were doing. So thank you all the young doctors of the region, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, who have joined us today. I think it was wonderful meeting you all and a very happy World Family Doctor, uh, World Family Doctor Day to all of you. Um, thank you all the country leads um, for always um, uh, supporting and for always um, uh, actively contributing and participating in all the spice suit activities. Uh, Roshan and Seren, especially for their active uh, contribution, Veena for the moderation, uh, Jyotika and Kinle for the, uh, for the presentations that they did. And Dr. Rabia, I think probably is not, I can't see Dr. Rabia, but thank you, Dr. Rabia, also for uh, the wonderful talk uh, that she did. I think all of the speakers and all the participants, uh, it was uh, great interacting with uh, all of you today. So uh, we'll conclude the session now. Uh, thank you so much.